A very good evening to you. Thank you for staying with TV3. This is News 360 Live from our studio here at Adesawe in Accra. I am Martin Asiedu Date. And I'm Aisha Yakubuhali coming up tonight. News 360 Headlines is brought to you by Flamingo Paint. Pepsodent Charcoal and Pepsodent Herbal. Opposition NDC hits back at Food and Agriculture Minister Bryony Champon, who has again repeated his claim that the new Patriotic Party will win, will use every possible means to win this year's elections. And in our e blog series, we take you to Nakpaili in the Nanumba South District of the Northern Region, where an e block project completed as far back as 2018 is yet to be utilized. And in news from elsewhere, Rwandan President Paul Kagame has been sworn in for a fourth term after winning last month's election by more than 99%. The details of these and many more stories, including sports and entertainment, coming up over the next one hour. Please stay with us. We are your election command center. Let's delve into some political stories now. And uh, if you haven't heard, then you probably would want to pay attention because a lot has, happening, uh, has started happening again regarding our politics. The member of parliament for Tamale Central, Ibrahim Mutala Mohammed, says it is reckless for the agri minister, Brian Echampong, to say that the new patriotic party will use any possible means to win the 2024 elections. He contends that the statement from the Abitifi Member of Parliament could foment trouble and raise tensions during the December elections. Brian Champong at a campaign rally in Sawem um, argued strongly that they will use all possible means to ensure that they win the 2024 elections, a position that the NDC has disagreed with vehemently. A statement has been condemned by the NDC. Let's listen to him. This is for Pell. I'm on Pell. Project 24 Apano. And now you're my winning day. This is not the first time the Abetifi MP has made a similar statement, projecting an emphatic win for the new patriotic party. For him, the NPP is an election winning machine, one that makes it practically impossible for the National Democratic Congress to win this year's election. The Minister of Food and Agriculture says anyone who does not understand this can go to bend the sea. Whether the NDC likes it or not, they will never win the 2024 election. We will do whatever it takes to win the elections. The NDC will not have any of that, describing Brian Achampon's campaign message as extremely reckless. Member of Parliament for Tamale Central fears this could be a strong ground for trouble in the polls. This is not the first time such reckless, dangerous and irresponsible statements are made by Brian Achampong and leading members of the NPP. Throughout the talk that Dr. Bonnie is engaging, they are not talking about issues. They are either using religion, ethnicity and many other divisive language for the purposes of winning an election. Inshallah, we will also do everything possible to prevent the NPP from winning this election. Experts say the polarized nature of the political space and the stakes involved in the December polls make it vulnerable for electoral instability. And many have warned against the use of indecent language to prevent incidents of violence. Motala Mohammed is worried about the silence of major stakeholders, including religious leaders, over such comment. But the deaf side of the religious leaders in this country Leaders of civil society organizations and chiefs, for me, it's legendary that such inflammatory words are used, such divisive and dangerous statements are made by leading members of the NPP on political party platforms. And none of them, they are all in a complete state of incommunicado. No one is condemning this. If these reckless statements were made by any leading member of NDC, we would have had them on the rooftop condemning President Hama and condemning everybody. So if they would remain silent, the NDC will not remain silent in the matter of things like this. And we are waiting for them. 
the West Africa Center for Counter Extremism has also urged political parties to abstain from intemperate language. The commentary we're seeing so far does not help the issues. The language they use is important. They have to be mindful of the fact that language shapes behavior. And the sort of language you use can inspire your followers to act in a similar manner, which could mean towards violence. Regardless, the NPP's Brian Achampon is confident the NPP can rely on pastors, imams and traditionalists in the party to annex victory easily. We are a political party that has pastors, imams and traditionalists. So whatever means we will take to win the elections, we will do so. And for stakeholders, there raise a crucial need for clear guidelines to ensure credible elections and peace. Christian Yale, TV3 News. Right, let's uh, interrogate this subject, uh, uh, you know, a bit in detail. Joining us now is um, Dr. John Osai Kwapong, who is a research fellow at CDD and also a political analyst. Doc, a very good evening to you. Thank you for joining us on News 360. Good evening to you as well. Uh, should we really be worried? This is about the upteenth time that um, Brian Echampong on a political stage has made some of such a rhetoric. Some say it's uh, uh, quite concerning, bordering on security. Others say, look, he's just doing what uh, the former Attorney General says, big bitch, big bitch, big bitch, big bitch. just, you know, trying to wile up the people who are there. Uh, from the analyst's perspective, should we be worried at all? I, I think it does create uh, some worrying moments. I know the first time that it happened, um, there was some explanation as to the fact that it shouldn't be taken uh, literally and that, of course, uh, they are law-abiding and should their uh, election results go otherwise, uh, they would hand over, but they are confident that it was really about being confident that they know the policies, the ideas, their performance, uh, would get them uh, re-elected. Re I know those comments were also roundly uh, condemned by different individuals, uh, myself included, who said, I can understand the in the heat, in the excitement of a campaign, sometimes our passions get the better of us. But the, this is the kind of rhetoric that you also want to be a little careful because you also don't know uh, who among your supporters may decide to take such rhetoric and give it a, ve a very literal meaning and interpretation, right? So as we get closer to the election, yes, it's going to be a hard fought battle. Both sides are going to try and campaign as hard as they can and try to convince as many voters as possible so they can win. But I think in the midst of all of that, we ought to really watch our political temperaments. Mm. You don't want to boil it over because of the meaning and interpretation that such rhetoric can mm. cause among other people. I mean, um, when, I, when I was sent the statement, part of me said, okay, look, let me, let me appeal to his better angels and say, we will do whatever it takes. Mm. If you want to give it a positive interpretation, you can say, look, it means that look, if they have to go to every single home across the length and breadth of Ghana to knock on doors to convince voters, that's a good thing. But um, it could also mean that you were willing to do anything. And mm. for me, the other or alternative interpretation that can be given to it is the reason why you don't even want to create a situation where we have to start debating what it means and what it doesn't mean and wh whether we should be worried. And again, such rhetoric for me is not very helpful right. um, as we approach the election. And, and Doc, what, what, what would you say about the fact that, like we all have agreed, he said it a number of times, should there be an institution or a body that should be checking in temperate language so that when such message uh, is put out, they can call the person to order or reprimand the person who makes, you know, these kinds of intemperate language that could, you know, trigger some insecurity in the country. Yes, I think the, I believe the security forces, for example, um, can, you know, uh, because I, I believe when the first instance happened, uh, there was some conversation with the political parties that, 
you know, encourage them to watch their, you know, their rhetoric uh, and make sure that they don't use interpret language that can potentially append uh, the, the the security and stability of the of the country. So for me, an institution uh, like our security forces, the police, uh, can you know um, issue statements, you know, that cautions, you know, our politicians, political party supporters that in the heat of the campaign, please be mindful of your language, make sure you stay away from rhetoric that, you know, has potential security implications for the country. Mm. Uh, we do have a peace council. Uh, the peace council can regularly also speak up against these matters. And then there are civil society organizations who regularly uh, do uh, point out these things and speak up against them. You also have the media who report on it and raise some of these questions like, well, should we be worried? Should we stay away from this? And make sure that uh, we are constantly having these conversations around the peace, the security of the country, but most importantly, making sure that um, we don't engage in this kind of intemperate language right. as we campaign vigorously to win the election. Okay, and my final thought uh, that I would be seeking from you will be that... Uh, the NDC says if they or any leading member of the NDC had made that comment, you know, you would have key state institutions or civil society or probably peace councils, etc., et coming at them. But anytime MPP does that or anybody within the MPP does that, they, they seem to be treated with kid gloves. Nobody gives them uh, that much of attention. Do you agree with that uh, observation by the NDC? No, because I, if I recall, the first time that um, the Honorable Brian Champon made those statements, I, I believe it was roundly condemned. Um, right. It was met with condemnation. And so whilst I understand their concerns about such rhetoric, um, I believe that there are enough voices that would treat such rhetoric from either side with the scorn that, uh, that it deserves. Mm. Always a pleasure talking to you, Dr. John Osai Kwapong. Uh, thank you so much for your time this evening. He is a fellow, a research fellow at CDD Ghana and also a political analyst. And our chairperson of the National Commission for Civic Education, Kathleen Adi, has underscored the need for Ghanaians to be sensitive to their civic responsibility of keeping the environment healthy for sustainable development. She says corrupt practices that tend to destroy the environment must be resisted to safeguard the future. The full participation of women and youth in national affairs helps in the attainment of peace, prosperity and development. The NTC's forum brought together students from various schools to discuss issues pertaining to the sustainability of peace during the election period. The commission says engaging the students is part of a series of activities put together to include religious tolerance. If we are not careful and we allow ourselves to be divided, either through money, violence, misinformation, or religion, if we allow ourselves to be divided as a country or as Ghanaians, we will now create a major problem because this year is a different type of election. We have an external threat in the sub-region that is dying to come and destabilize this country. And those threats thrive where there is disagreement and where there is a misunderstanding. The various schools were made to share their knowledge and understanding on political issues. Electoral violence should be a thing of the past because it scuffs the ankles of our soul and derelicts the epic of our minds. Even though in this modern time all our politicians I would say are corrupt, but yes, they should vote for the person who they really think is ready for the job and can do the job and do it well. Money in politics breeds corruption as well as money over merit. I'm making decisions at home, in our workplaces, in schools. We don't involve violence. We don't use knives and all other things to you know, hurt people. So there's no difference here. We can just go to the police station, do what you're supposed to do peacefully, go back home and then decide to watch on the television and everything will be fine. The negative effects of violent elections from parts of the world, particularly some African countries, have shown women and children are the most vulnerable. The National Commission for Civic Education, NCC, says it will continue to engage students and women in other regions to ensure a successful and peaceful election. 
Now let's bring you to the Greater Accra region where the Homowo Festival has been marked across several Ghana communities in the region. However, the desire for peace and unity before, during and after the December 7 election was key in all messages. Joseph Armstrong Golda Logbe followed the procession and has the rest of the story. The festival celebration of the Gandangwe communities starts from 6 July, first by the people of Nungwa, followed by the Lantejawe, the Adans, Tema, Gamashi, Osu, Teshi, La, Boom, Prom Prom. The festival announces the abundance of food after the people of the Gandangwe descent endured years of farming. During the celebration, the native food Pukui a product from maize and palm oil is sprinkled by chiefs within a defined jurisdiction with the belief of feeding the ancestors who lived during the days of hunger. The sprinkled food also serves crippling animals. Speaking on behalf of the Gamanche, Ni Taki Teku Chlu, the second, Ni Teku Tuman, the first, Gansul Obunufuache wished all his subjects a peaceful homework celebration. He's wishing all and sundry happy new year, God's blessings and prosperity to all guns. He also called on all Ghanaians to ensure a peaceful election on December 7th. We need peace and tranquility to prevail in our land. It's just about elections. So whichever party that you are supporting, make sure after voting, we leave our country as it is. Some Queen Mothers also called for peace ahead of the election. Okay, as we prepare for this year's election, I want to encourage the youth to avoid violence, cast your ballot and go back home. Let's all unite to ensure a peaceful election this year. Radio Bate, TV Bate, The festival celebration is also intended to unite families across the Gandangwe communities. The message rides from the Ga Manche down to the very illiterate here in the Ga states is clear. They want peace before, during and after the December 7th general election. Joseph Armstrong, go Dalibu, TV3, Gamashi, Accra. Also, the flag bearer of the NDC, John Jumani Mahama, has questioned government's financial clearance of some 17,000 nurses to be enrolled onto the payroll three months to the elections. Speaking to student nurses in Bolga, John Mahama described the move as political gimmick, challenging government to also pay their allowances in full. All of us are waiting for 7th December. We know the problems with training nurses. And that is why when we're in government, we said we're going to substitute your allowance with the student's loan. That's what we said. And that is because we wanted to create more employment for you. What is important for you is not the allowance. It is to get a job when you finish school. But somebody came and said he will pay the allowances. Unfortunately, it was 419. When, they, when, when he went to Techiman, it took a young, small trainee nurse like you to say that you promised us you pay our allowances. I entered nursing training three years ago. I'm in my final year. For the three years I've been in school, I have not received even allowance once. 
And you know what? They pretended like they didn't know. Oh, allowances. I'm not sure. I have to ask the Minister of Finance. I am saying that come and pay the nurses. You owe them almost 30 months of arrears. Some of them have left school without receiving their allowances. And some of them are going to leave school again without re receiving their allowances. But one thing I can assure you, it is about jobs. And NDC is committed to jobs. And so we are going to create the situation where we can employ as many of you as possible. What the MPP does is, they don't employ for four years. Then when it's getting to elections, they quickly say, oh, we've opened the portal for employment. And so they say they've got financial clearance to employ 15,000 nurses. Why have you waited till three months to elections before you say you're going to employ 15,000 nurses? And which ones are you going to employ? Are you going to start from four years ago or five years ago? Which batches are you going to employ? And that is why we must create a condition so that when you are coming out of training, we are sending you into employment at once. Let's get on to our e-block series that we have been keeping a very close tabs on for you. Now, a completed e-block project at Nakpanyili in the Nanumba South District of the Northern Region has been abandoned despite its completion since 2018. Residents say the continuous delay in putting the beautifully painted building to use is affecting secondary education in the area. In our series of abandoned e-blocks, my colleague uh, Christopher Mwako visited the Nakpanyili e-block project and has come through with the following report. The Nakpanyili Community Day Senior High School project was started by the Eswal Mahama government to serve as a technical senior high school in the area. Before the NDC exited power in 2017, the project was almost 90% complete, but work on the project stalled in 2017 with the contractor, Chief Sofo Azoka, citing lack of payment as a key factor. Even though this project started under the Eswal Mahama administration, it took the ruling New Patriotic Party under President Ekufuado to complete the project. This is one of the many e-blocks that the MPP is touting itself to have completed. Residents say they are disappointed in the continuous delay in operationalizing the school. I am disappointed. The community is disappointed. Uh, its surrounding community communities are also disappointed. And then the entire district. Something that is supposed to be saving the, um, uh, the community and its surrounding uh, this thing. And uh, it has to be left at the mercy of the weather. Actually, we are not happy. The entire community is not happy about the whole situation. We feel so sad about it, and we are very disappointed about that. And I think it is also one of the major problems we are facing in this community, which we, were, we would have been happy if the school were to be active. This is a marker board that has been fated. Apart from this marker board, all the ceiling farms Four of them have equally been fitted. Now, one thing that is missing in this particular classroom is furniture. Apart from furniture, everything is set for normal class to take place in this classroom. In 2022, Education Minister Dr. Yao Ose Educhum refuted claims that the MPP government abandoned the e-blocks. He explained that most of the e-blocks were situated in the bush, far from beneficiary communities, making it difficult to admit students. He hinted that President Ekufuado has directed the construction of a number of dormitory facilities to make it more conducive for academic activities. But a visit to the Nakpayili Day Senior High School revealed that the school 
is not benefiting from the expansion projects as hinted by the Education Minister. District Chief Executive for Nanumba South, Mamunde Banabas, disclosed that plans are far advanced to convert the school into a girls' senior high school and assured that the school will receive its first batch of students once the conversion processes are completed. Residents living around the Nakpayili enclave have described this structure as a white elephant because it is yet to serve its intended purpose. They are hoping that the Ministry of Education will this time fulfill its promise of posting the first batch of students to this school this academic year. Until then, the future of hundreds of children living around the Napayili enclave will continue to hang in the balance. Christopher Mwako, TV3 News, Nakpaili. Meanwhile, the Sekesia e-block project in the Upper Menya Krobo district has stalled for over seven years, leaving the site overgrown with weeds. Opinion leaders have expressed their displeasure that the delay is hindering their children's access to senior high school education. As a result, eligible students without financial support have dropped out and turned to motorbike riding to make a living, while teenage pregnancy rate has become rife. The e-block project at Sikeswa began in 2015 aimed to expand secondary education in the Upper Mayor Krobo district which has over 70,000 population. However, after the first floor was constructed in earnest, the project was abandoned. Weeds have since taken over and the building materials are deteriorating. Residents of Sikeswa and surrounding areas had high hopes for the completion of the e-block day school which could have provided greater access to education for their children. Sikiswa is a farming community in the Upper Menya Krobo district, second largest community after Asesewa, the district capital. Most residents, including smallholder farmers, fall into the low income category. The local chief, John Kumi, argues that the community deserves better and questions why changes in government must impact projects meant to benefit local communities. Government, no, eh, or dear, bro, pa, let us say, or CC, pa, 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 pa. Government has disappointed us with underdevelopment in this area. The e block school, abandoned, says it all. Other local leaders and parents expressed their frustration over the abandonment of the e-block Senior High Day School, which could have accommodated about 500 students from Sikeswa and its environs. The abandoned e-block has grind economic activities to halt. We are pleading on the government to complete it. They are concerned that the situation is contributing to the rise in teenage pregnancy rates and causing male teenagers to tend to motor riding to earn a living. School no, it's another The school needs to be completed as our wards are yet to enroll into secondary education. The abandoned e block could have served this purpose. Uh, at the end of the day, you have to uh, sell almost everything you have in, in trying to educate your child. Do we are talking about free SHS, but there are other components of the uh, cost in sending your child to Slavic Kufodia or Udmaze, which is very expensive. During the John Mahama administration, a $156 million financing agreement with the World Bank was signed to expand infrastructure, increase access, and improve quality learning outcomes of secondary education in deprived communities across the country. The buildings, known as E blocks, for their distinctive E shape, were completed by a loan secured by the Ghana Education Trust Fund in 2018. Sadly, the Sikeswa E block, along with others, remains abandoned years later. This is News 360. Stay with us. We have some more news for you.
Welcome back to News 360. Now, traders at the Agbogbolushi market are calling on government to, uh, as a matter of agency, provide them with waste bins and fix their roads. According to the traders, the absence of waste bins and the deplorable state of their roads is having a negative impact on their health and businesses. Here's a report by Samuel Yeboah Adams. The Agbogbolushi market, arguably one of the biggest markets located in the capital, Accra, is noted for heaps of rubbish, bad roads, and choked gutters amidst vigorous commerce. Traders at the market have over the years complained about the state of the market, yet interventions have not been desirable, forcing them to trade under unsanitary conditions. The traders who spoke to TV3 say the absence of waste bins is the bane of the market. We want dust bins. When they bring one dustbin, it takes years before they bring another. They should get us dustbins. Those who operate chop bar come and pour the remnants in the gutter. It is very disturbing because it causes us to fall sick. The gutters become choked and as drivers, we come together to clean it. The waste bins become full in a short while and we don't get anyone to empty it for us. Drivers and motorists are not spared, especially when it rains. If it rains now, it becomes difficult to use the road. The government should come to our aid because we are suffering. The nature of the road is such that it affects us, the drivers, and also the traders. When it rains, it becomes muddy, and it becomes dusty when it's sunny. The bad state of the road affects us. It prevents people from coming to buy from here. Market leaders say though the Accra Metropolitan Assembly has been helpful, the bad nature of the roads is a worry. The AMA sometimes bring cars to take the refuse, but when they don't come, we gather the rubbish and give it to a truck because the market is for us and we sell in it. There are a lot of potholes on the road, so we want government to come and fix them for us. Despite their dominance in Ghana's agricultural sector, female farmers lament facing multiple disadvantages. Acquisition of farmlands and limited access to finance and inputs remain a huge challenge for the women in most parts of the country. But the Ghana Association of Female Agriculture and Fish Farmers Award winners contends the country's quest to achieve food security will only be possible if women in the agri sector are giving the right support. Women make up more than half of the agricultural labor force in Ghana, according to data from the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. Their role in the production, processing, and marketing of agricultural produce is consequential. Yet female farmers have over the years not received the equitable support to grow in their business. The Ghana Association of Female Agriculture and Fish Farmers Award winners is stepping up effort to help address challenges faced by women farmers in the country. In Ghana, it's not uh, easily, women cannot acquire lands easily. Equipment, machinery and equipment is a challenge for them. If we don't engage the women who form the majority, then we're going to have challenges when it comes to food security. So we are appealing to the government that they should give us a helping hand. We are not asking them to do everything for us. We are asking them to help us grow so that together we can make Ghana secured in terms of food. The group has created a platform for farmers to come under one umbrella, build their capacities, and give them voice to interface with duty bearers and advocate for what is due them. The Ministry of Food and Agriculture, however, emphasized government commitment to supporting women in the agri sector. When it comes to agriculture, it is the women who drive it from, from, from the farm to the table. So 
uh, we really need to do something about it. And in the in the course of implementing this, our uh, plan for food and jobs, we have recognised the the role of women, and and that is why in anywhere that we've been to, we make sure that these women uh, are at the forefront of anything that we do in the ministry to support them. Around the world, over 700 million people suffer from hunger. The women farmers say that number could be significantly reduced if they had the same rights and resources as their male counterparts and empowered to contribute fully to the food system. To eradicate hunger, malnutrition, poverty, and empower women by 2020 in line with the Sustainable Development Goals 1, 2, and 5, government and other stakeholders will have to invest massively in the agriculture sector with priority to women farmers. Now, in recent years, Accra has seen a significant surge in nightlife businesses in the extent, to the extent of hours aimed at boosting sales and demand for services after dark. From local food joints, street hawking to transport systems, Alexander Asari looks at the economic viability of these nocturnal enterprises and their impact on job creation. As the sun sets over Accra, a new wave of economic activity begins. As the streets that once buzzed with daytime commerce transformed into a vibrant hub of nocturnal trade, our visit to the popular Osu Night Market, a kinke hub joint which has served the enclave for many years, is still occupied with lots of customers in the wee hours of the day. Fresh. <laughs> Why don't you prefer a fried, but you prefer a one that is grilled? I prefer the one that is grilled because I feel like it's healthy. No, so it's less expensive. At Abekana Pass, the neighborhoods come alive with the sound of music, the aroma of the street food and the hustle and bustle of businesses. I chanced on a second-hand footwear business, which has attracted buyers trying to get a pair or two. So you normally, when you go to Accra, Cantamanto, you normally bring good stuff uh, early in the morning, let's say around 5 a.m. So this one is 100 cities. I'm just saying, I think it's okay. I couldn't help but to join in the fray to get a pair for myself. My throat is parched and I got coconut to quench it. Curious, I engaged Kweko Rasta to know why he sells coconut at this hour. I about eight o'clock. Eight o'clock and a papa. And a papa. Two o'clock in time, eh? Midnight, somewhere twelve o'clock. I was just saying, no, la pas senti se fes na eh ni pa ukuma kope mse adiabechi. Clothes, shoes, and all kinds of household wares were displayed in the glare of commuters and passers-by attracting buyers and undeniably making La Paz a hub of brisk business and a definition of night hustle. Despite the many benefits, the night economy in Accra faces several challenges. Security is a primary concern. 
the safety of patrons and business owners during the late hours should be prioritized with an increased police presence and better lighting systems in key areas. The transport industry is not left out in this new normal. Isaac Ofori drives to and from Accra, Takrade. He told me business booms in the night because of the absence of gridlock. For passers-by, the flexibility of day and night travels cannot be overemphasized. According to economist and associate professor of finance at the University of Ghana Business School, Professor Lord Mensa, a crest night market has come to stay and required international interventions for its proper growth as conversation on a 24-hour economy is rife. It's not supposed to be a standalone policy, right? It should be a policy that will be owned by the government. There should be the ownership by government. There should be a sunset clause on it because to some extent, at the point where the economic the economy becomes favorable, interest rate becomes low, and inflation rate tends to be low, the private man must own this 24-hour economy. Instead Great report there by Alex Asari. It's now time for some sports news. Three Entertainment. In entertainment news tonight, the search for Ghana's most beautiful lady enters its fourth week tonight with a thrilling new challenge. After last week's fashion show, the spotlight now shifts onto the contestants' first performances. This week is all about storytelling, and the contestants are ready to dazzle with their creativity. Each regional representative will take the stage to present well-researched, culturally rich stories from their region along with their compelling backstories. How the contestants perform in this critical task will be key to their continued success in the competition. You can dial star 713 star 13 hash to vote for your favorite contestant or better still, vote on the TV3 app. Who will emerge as the best storyteller? Stay tuned and keep your fingers crossed. Catch all the action after News 360. Don't miss it. Let's find out what's happening on the international front. Rwandan President Paul Kagame has been sworn in for a fourth term after sweeping to victory in an election last month with more than 99% of the vote. Several dozen heads of state and other dignitaries from African nations attended the inauguration ceremony on Sunday at a packed 45,000-seat stadium in Kigali, where crowds have started gathering from the early morning. The outcome of the July 15 poll was never in doubt for Kagame, who has ruled the small African nation since its 1994 genocide, first as de facto leader and then president. He won 99.18% of the ballots cast and secured another five years in power, according to the National Electoral Commission. Rights activists said the 66-year-old's overwhelming victory was a stark reminder of the lack of democracy in Rwanda. U.S. President Donald Trump has accused Iran of hacking his campaign. The Republican nominee's campaign team issued a statement late on Saturday claiming that the Iranian government stole the distributor's sensitive internal documents. The accusation came after Microsoft issued a report detailing foreign attempts to interfere in this year's U.S. election campaign. The campaign team cited past tensions between Trump and Iran but did not provide direct evidence. And that's how we bring the bulletin to an end. By the way, if you want to stay updated on content that we produce and churn out here at Media General, that's the queue, the QR code on the screen. You scan it with your phone, 
get the latest information regarding news and entertainment, all our videos, and many, many several other content that we churn out. You will be in the know and be part of the national and global conversations. Do scan and be updated. That's it for us tonight. There's more on 3news.com. My name is Aisha Yakubuhali. And I am Martin Asiedu Datim. Have a good evening.